this evening completes the series of five talks which have been planned for this seminar. I would like, first of all, to gather up one or two loose ends that have come to attention. One or two of the friends are a little uncertain about uh, some matters. Therefore, with your permission, we will briefly reiterate one or two phases of our problem. In the last talk, we mentioned that the over-self or inner nature of the small child or the babe is not essentially different from that of the adult, and that growth is a revelation of potential rather than a creation of potential. This means primarily that in terms of the broader aspects, certainly of Oriental philosophy, the individual is born into this world not as a beginner, but as a traveler, who are passing from one caravansary or rest house to another along the pilgrimage of existence. While the newborn babe is apparently quite helpless, and we must await the natural processes by means of which its individuality will emerge to our recognition. This does not mean that the individuality which we observe is being generated at the time we observe it. Rather, it is a gradual release through an increasingly adequate instrument so that by the time of maturity or majority, we are inclined to assume that the individual, having now possession of the instrument which he has fashioned, and which was created for the purpose of expressing his internal individuality, the individual would be able to express himself on the level of his own maturity. Now this again does not imply that by this maturity he reaches some over-perfection. He is releasing himself as he is. But we do know that this potential makes possible a maturity that is greater than childhood. It makes possible the gradual revelation of the cultural person through the biological structure. To say that there is an essential difference between the child at three and the adult of 21 would be to assume that in the 18 intervening years there has been a marked or noticeable degree of cultural attainment. We are not in a position to say that this is true. We are only in a position to say that until the individual reaches his majority, we cannot determine even with relative accuracy his actual cultural level. Consequently, evolution or growth which certainly does take place within the internal life of the individual, is not measured in the years from infancy to adulthood, but just as the person having achieved maturity is then in the best position and condition to make rapid advancement in his own cultural life. So the advancement is made in maturity and is not reflected in the growth from childhood toward maturity. By the time he has attained maturity, he has attained to his own heritage, whatever this heritage may be. On this heritage he builds. Here is the parallel to psychic growth, namely that psychic growth is attained when the instruments necessary for its attainment have been brought to their maturity. Then the individual grows as a being. Prior to that time he is attaining the level of his achieved growth, and he is doing this by means of the gradual unfoldment of an organism capable of sustaining a more complete expression of his internal life. There is no conflict, therefore, in this statement, namely that the individual, for all purposes, is not essentially different as a small child uh, than he will be as an adult person. We may hope, however, that between the period of adulthood and the end of his material life, he will make major steps in the unfoldment of his internal culture. In this way, attaining the essential growth for which this life was intended. 
I hope that that will clarify that point for the friend who was interested. Now this evening we have a rather serious problem to consider because wherever we approach the dimensions of prophecy or go on into uh, elements relating to the shape of things to come, we tread upon extremely dangerous ground. And the individual who is in the greatest problem with this matter is the one who is laboring under a fixed pattern of opinions. He has grave trouble in escaping from levels which he has created in his own thinking and to which he forces progress to conform. Therefore, in connection with this, there are certain definite factors we have to consider. The first is perhaps a clearer understanding of the difference between race and culture. Actually, these terms are not even nearly synonymous. A race is a biological instrument. It is a descent by means of structure and within a biological framework of generation and heredity. A race, therefore, as we have suggested, is a kind of biological unit. Culture is not, in any sense of the word, biological. And anthropology immediately separates itself from biology on this ground. Culture is not directly associated with race. It is not the primary product of race. It is not essentially the primary end or result for which race is devised. Culture stands as something which is essentially larger, deeper, and more meaningful than any biological differentiation. Modern anthropology, therefore, takes the ground that all races have a certain common essential capacity for culture, that culture can be transmitted from race to race at any time, that culture can be brought forth out of racial groups without any serious impediment due to racial demarcations or separations. Every biological racial unit is capable of heterogeneous cultural growth. It is capable of evolving culture from its own experience. It is capable of maturing culture through contact with other culture groups. It is also capable of extending its own culture into other areas and into other periods of time. Culture, therefore, cuts through all such boundaries as we generally associate with biological heredity or racial differentiation. The modern anthropologist takes it for granted that all races participate in culture and that all races can make cultural contributions to other races. Cultural contribution is, however, very largely a matter of appreciation. The barrier lies in the homogeneity of the older racial developments. The race is raised arbitrary, artificial barriers in many instances against the cultures of other people. This does not mean that these barriers originated in biology. They originated possibly in the psychological interpretation of biological differences. They originated in a man assuming that the color of his skin affected his cultural insight, or that by his material structure or by other external factors, areas in which he lived, and things of that nature, his cultural life must be uh, modified, changed, reduced, or restricted. This, however, has nothing to do with race biologically speaking. This has to do with the gradual emergence of race culturally limiting itself by its own culture. This type of position we observe among some ancient peoples. And we also observe that progress is more rapid in those areas where these restrictions have naturally disappeared or have been overcome by contact with other peoples. <coughs>
Thus we may say for our essential purpose uh, that the future, looking into the future of man as an anthropological unit, anthropology takes the square and certain ground that the final total richness of human culture must result from contributions from all culture groups. That these contributions should not be regarded as conflicting, but as commonly enriching. We are beginning to appreciate this perhaps more than was considered conceivable a hundred years ago. Today we are beginning to recognize that culture breaks through most of the arbitrary boundaries which we have established. Perhaps one of the most obvious instances of this is on the level of arts, perhaps somewhat on the level of music. We are beginning to see it on the level of theater and also in crafts and now in sciences. We are beginning to recognize, for example, the importance of the cultural, cultural contributions of Asia, merely in terms of architecture, in terms of commodities, in terms of decoration and decor of all kinds, in terms of clothing, weavings, fabrics, designs. We find in our California homes a tremendous tendency today towards the recognition of the uh, architectural desirability of the Japanese house and garden. And we're becoming aware of this type of thing. Anthropology tells us that this awareness of the desirability of the culture of other peoples, this in itself is one of the most powerful agents towards world peace and towards the common understanding of mankind. When we really understand and share the culture of other people, we gain an insight into them, not possible on an intellectual level, and certainly not even suspected on a biological level. Today, the family, which certainly would view with grave apprehension an interracial marriage, is not at all unhappy over uh, furnishing their home according to the decor of the race they would not want their child to marry into. We have, therefore, a meeting on a cultural level, and no meeting on a biological level. This, in turn, does not necessarily, with the anthropologist, become important. To him, biology, per se, is a subject in itself, and biology is going to make very slight contribution to the solution of cultural problem. Therefore, it is far more important that we become aware of the cultures of people than that we become too profoundly involved in the study of their racial demarcations. Uh, race, because of its physical implications, is a difficult barrier to move. Culture, because it is intangible in itself, and because it applies to a group of faculties and powers, not as easily prejudiced as certain others, we find culture moving in where the individual himself who created the culture would not be acceptable. We have also many instances today in which uh, individuals with very slight sympathy uh, for the uh, uh, national or racial groups uh, with which he comes in contact, paying large sums of money uh, to secure their art or to become trained in their dance or their theater or their music. Uh, these cultural points also strengthen the concept of the anthropologist, namely that culture has absolutely no boundaries except those which are placed upon it by human prejudice, and that it is the gradual restoration of the universality of culture that will make a marked contribution to the future of humanity. Now on the problem of this difference between biological and anthropological issues, uh, anthropology gives us three very interesting and important lines of thinking or fields or areas to examine. Uh, these areas he considers as indicative of the uh, fundamental issues with which we are faced. One is nationality, the second is language, and the third is religion. These are three good examples of the essential difference between anthropology and biology. Nationality, for example, were it biological, 
would mean the inevitable conformity of race and nation. This is not true in actual fact. There are cases, and we have them today, which we call homogeneous peoples. A homogeneous person in this concept is one whose nationality, language, and religion are all within one area. That is, the religion does not go beyond the boundaries of his nation. His nation does not go beyond the boundaries of its racial uh, habitat, the area in which it existed, and the language is homogeneous or unique to that people and has not easily been conveyed to other peoples. Thus there are peoples of nations and when you mention them you almost inevitably tell when you say for example that this individual is Chinese you most almost certainly think of him as Chinese racially and culturally because race and culture in this case are very closely associated. On the other hand there are many groups where such uh, cultivation of isolation as uh, crippled China for many thousands of years uh, is not so noticeable. And uh, we do find that within racial structure <coughs> nations rise and fall. We will have a nation and of course we can think of one outstanding example, the British Commonwealth of Nations, in which practically every race, every culture, and every religion exist together, or are found within a broad so-called national pattern. Perhaps the most immediate example that we realize is our own nation, in which we have uh, not only religions from everywhere, and nationalities from everywhere, gradually mingling into our nationality, but we also have a variety of languages which, while they gradually disappear, do not entirely vanish with the result that in most of our large communities there are still areas or districts in which local customs, local languages, and local religions are very largely preserved intact, and yet a larger nationality uh, absorbs them or takes them into a situation. A man will say, I am a Buddhist, I am Chinese, and I am an American citizen. We have now a new kind of pattern indicating that Buddhism, Chinese, are not incompatible with Americanism as a national entity. We can say the same of many so that are not impossible on some festive occasion for us to quickly draw together 40 or 50 nations for some celebration or some exchange of fraternal good wishes. And these things bespeak the fact that nation is not biological, nor shall we assume that language is biological, or religion biological. Religion is divisible, like most other branches of human thought, into two grand groups. Those religions which are homogeneous and those which are, which are heterogeneous. There are religions that have extended very little beyond the boundaries of their original ground. And where either by obligation, by tradition, or by other circumstances, they are still bound very close to race and also to nation. Against these are three great religions, and they are the most vital and active religions that we have in the world today, Christianity, Buddhism, and Islamism. All of these are heterogeneous religions. Uh, they are not religions which require that you live in a country, that you belong to a nation, that you stem from a race, or uh, that you uh, belong only in communities and areas where such faiths are prominent. You have almost complete freedom. Buddhism probably is an example of Eastern heterogeneity, for it has influenced every racial and nation national group in Asia. Christianity has done the same to the West and has to some degree penetrated Asia. Uh, the um, Islamism is now represented in 228 national units. Therefore, these religions have broken through nations, 
proving that culture, again, is larger than nationality, and nationality in its turn has proven that it is larger than biology. This largeness uh, to the anthropologist becomes the basis of a credo, and he, in his own little way, or large way, as we wish to look at it, believes that he is making a vital and valuable contribution by making the science of internationalism the basis of culture. Now, he is not referring to internationalism as a manner of destroying cultural entity. He is uh, rather terming it a means of establishing or recognizing a fact which has always existed, uh, namely that cultures are not essentially competitive, that cultures are also not essentially comparative, that cultures constitute a motion toward common good, and that therefore that uh, the future, a future of better and wiser people, will be a future enriched by many cultural motions. Contrary to biology also, the anthropologist views culture as essentially unhistorical. The fact that a people has disappeared and has not existed as a political unit or a national unit or a racial unit for two, three, four, or five thousand years, or that its religion has been dead for a thousand years, these circumstances do not mean that these so-called vanished factors are not of continuing cultural significance. In other words, Egypt, as far as classical Egypt is concerned, is dead. The modern Egyptian does not belong to the ancient dynastic lines at all. He is an Arab who has moved in at a comparatively recent date. Yet can we say that Egypt, as a cultural entity, is dead? Not as long as we still use its architectural motives in the development of public buildings, not as long as we still admire its art and use this art to decorate our homes, and not, not as long as hundreds of living scholars write books about this dead country, telling its virtues and uh, pointing out many of its cultural achievements which can be useful to us even in our own time. Therefore, history permits us to share in the cultural achievements of other peoples. And history through this also gives us the opportunity to res restore or resurrect, at least as intellectual food for contemplation, uh, the peculiar achievements of these people in varying directions, particularly as it may bear upon problems of today, or which they may have approached more successfully than we have, or have run into difficulties of which we should be aware lest we follow in the same course. Thus culture is unhistorical and is broken through in a very different way from the biological descent of races. Actually, in anthropology, the overthought is that we shall gradually gain a common level of heritage in culture and that this culture is the basis of our ultimate capacity or ability to live together as one world. This, as I say, does not imply that anthropology is particularly interested in imposing blanket cultures upon people. This most anthropologists today regard as a very serious defect and at the very least premature. In other words, we have had some very interesting experiences working today with peoples outside of our own culture groups. The tendency of these peoples, particularly in small and isolated areas, is to gradually vanish. And one of the uh, points that perhaps we can mention at the moment is the uh, influence of African art upon European art culture. Uh, men like Baudel came very strongly and powerfully under African art impulse. We also find uh, a number of the so-called outstanding moderns, such as Picasso, admitting their indebtedness to the primitive cultures of the French Sudan, Bali, and other um, comparatively isolated areas. Uh, these artists 
regardless of how we may regard them, personally felt a great obligation to what they regarded as the dynamic sincerity of the primitive. They found in it an escape from the overworking, uh, the meticulous l uh, loss of value that came from a more or less homogeneity of our culture in Europe at a previous date. They found Europe to be more or less drowning in its own traditional arts and un unable to break through into a larger art consciousness. Now these artists and anthropologists who worked with them and who knew the situation realized that the work that they wished to do must be done quickly inasmuch as the native primitive arts were rapidly disappearing. They were disappearing under the impact of the contact of other cultures. Other cultures, uh, largely egocentric and arrogant, were simply imposing themselves upon these people, ridiculing the achievements of these primitive culture groups and trying to sweep them into the common mechanistic art concepts of our time. And experience has shown that 25 years after these tribes and groups came under so-called modern cultural influence, their native arts deteriorated to nothing. And today, examples purchased in those areas are not worth bringing home. Uh, the uh, impact of the foreign culture on the grounds that our way was better, that our arts were superior and our culture more advanced, wiped out something which we will sometime wish had survived in some way. The point the anthropologist would like to make is that the relationships of culture should not be one imposing itself dogmatically upon another, but each <coughs> culture attempting as far as possible to mature and draw out the culture of other groups, realizing the infinite potential that is locked even within the most savage concept of life. That if this can be unfolded, if it can be allowed to move uh, under protection and direction, but without overshadowing and overwhelming, it will reveal things to us that we really want to know. It is very much like the bringing up of the child. If we destroy the child's individuality, we produce the type of person who makes no further contribution to himself or anyone else. The problem is how can we direct the child? How can we prevent the child from come, falling in common pitfalls which will be injurious to it? How can we lead it without dominating it? How can we educate it without destroying its individuality? How can we help it to be itself? And by what wonderful virtue can we restrain ourselves from attempting to overwhelm it with ourselves so that it becomes merely a cut-out likeness of the dominating influences? Uh, the anthropologist feels that much more time and thought should be given to the protection of the cultural spirit of peoples. And he also points out that one of the deadly enemies of culture is the commercialization of arts and cultural factors. That the individual uh, moving from the expression of himself because he is himself to the pure mechanical labor of working for profit alone, this transition is one of the most terrible down motions that exists within a world of culture. The reduction of culture to economic terms is the extinction of culture. And uh, this situation takes on tremendous force, even in our way of life, where pride of work is rapidly disappearing and the penalty upon creativity is becoming heavier than the average person can carry. Now, one of the out outstanding reasons for this bad state of affairs is ignorance. And the ignorance centers heavily in the field of anthropology. The average individual is not informed as to what may be regarded as the ethics of cultural relationships. And as a result of that, he is unable to take a mature position himself. The same is true so often of parents and certainly of community activities 
and we see traces of it uh, unfortunately developing even in our educational fields where things should be different. The release of the individual is being forgotten and the process of transforming him into a robot according to the common acceptances of his time. This progress or process is advancing far too rapidly. So we have here this uh, concept which anthropology wishes to point to the future of things. And as we say, in some matters, we may not be completely uh, in harmony with the anthropological viewpoint, but in certain other matters, we certainly have a strong sympathy for it and a recognition of its importance. Progress in terms of anthropology is progress in terms of culture. Now, culture is not uh, we will say organization. It is not uh, the factory procedure. Culture could not exist or could not conceive the desirability of a world which is gradually transformed into a vast laboratory or a vast economic enterprise or a factory or a superstore. Uh, these uh, ends uh, for the effort of man through the ages would be regarded as cultural suicide. It would be the final extinction of everything by means of which man has achieved distinction from other animal creatures, for he could scarcely arrive at a more satisfactory um, industrial organization than that which has been attained by the ants. That is not the end for which he is devised. Anthropology, therefore, points out that progress cannot and must not be on a level. Tomorrow must not be today plus only more of the same. And this uh, uh, is a very important point. The man who has one factory, looking into the future in terms of success, must not come to consider success the possession of two factories. And that is one of our very serious weaknesses. He must not consider that he is successful because starting with one store, he ends with a chain of 400 stores. This has absolutely nothing to do with culture. He can achieve this, be born a barbarian and die a barbarian. It has no cultural significance whatsoever. The same is true of all motion on levels. Uh, the individual thinking in terms of one nation, composed of many nations, like they are now, only perhaps uniting to absolute political necessity, each one remaining the same kind of a belligerent character it is today, and depending for their unity upon legislation, or the arising of an autocrat who can force that unity upon them. This has no cultural significance whatever and has no future. It is simply the same thing getting bigger without getting better. Therefore, anything that gets bigger without getting better is suffering from a kind of bloat or something of that nature. When a little dog swells up, we are not impressed. We know that it is not growing, it is merely sick. <laughs> and there are a great many things that we consider as expansion, which are very little more than bloat, leaving none of the essential values touched and accomplishing nothing which is going to make this a better world for anyone to live in. Or organization the tremendous and continuous development of things as they are pushed into the future means nothing. Nor does it mean anything that things as they are shall be done better in the future. The question is, will better things be done in the future? The concept, for instance, that we are now able to travel in an airplane at any convenient speed from 300 miles an hour to 1,200 miles an hour should not cause us to assume that when we can travel up 
2,000 miles an hour, we have attained anything whatsoever in terms of culture. We have not. We have only increased the danger of accident and have, in all probabilities, fallen under a spell which will leave us no rest until we can go 3,000 miles an hour. But in our way of thinking, we are trying to push a way of life that is not mature into tomorrow, so as to make tomorrow merely the fulfillment of the unfinished experiments of today. Now we may, of course, through a certain amount of this kind of motion, ultimately achieve accidentally or incidentally a certain amount of culture. We will gain culture through regret for one thing, which is one way in which most persons choose to learn. We may also, in the course of our exploration of space, come upon a culture group stronger than our own, which may give us pause for thought. We may also find in our experimentation, in the form of byproducts, certain things which will advance human life, human security, and by so doing, offer man increased cultural opportunity. But if he does not make use of this opportunity, then his cultural uh, growth still remains unchanged. A good and common example of that is the matter of conveniences and commodities that we have today. The average person today is surrounded with so many labor-saving devices that we would assume that he would have saved sufficient time to devote something to culture. But the average person is busier than he ever was and is not advancing culturally at all. One individual told me that the great trouble was that all his conveniences were out of order most of the time and it took him more time to keep them running that he had previously expanded in doing the various things for which they substituted. <laughs> also, he is under the heavy uh, load of financing these productions, which require greater effort and greater labor and greater servitude to his own conveniences. We ha regardless of how we look at it, we must admit that this age, which 50 years ago we were solemnly assured would give man the leisure to be great, has given him no leisure at all and very little sign of greatness. He is perhaps even a little more confused and a little more nervous and a little sicker than he was before all these good things were added unto him. The, uh, the cultural progress has not been achieved. Thus anthropology comes to our aid with a very, very simple but overwhelming concept that all so-called progress must ascend. It must be a motion forward and upward, not simply a motion forward. And the only way a motion can move both forward and upward is that the motion itself shall have the strength of forward motion, and those regulating the motion shall have the consciousness of upward motion. And if these two do not work together, we land on a level. And uh, while we don't agree with the pre uh, Colombian concept that if you went far enough in any direction you'd fall off the earth it is still quite conceivable that we will fall off something if our culture does not gain wings of its own in some way to carry us over uh, the uh, level of problem for which we have as yet no solution and the anthropology assures us that we can never secure solution <coughs> out of the problem itself, that we, in every instance solution must be bestowed. And this bestowal arises from the conscious capacity of man to give something to the things that he does. This thing that he must do is to give them wings, that they may have not only advancement, but have means of ascension into a higher plane or level of usefulness. So anthropology uh, points out that in the progress of advancement as we have it today, culture is our weakest point, that it is the ignored value, that it is an intangible to most people, 
but is more real than tangible things. For upon culture uh, is dependent use, proper use. And without the understanding which improves the level of usages, our, our sciences will go on on a level because usage requiring better rather than more will force betterness. But usage demanding only more will only force further abundance of the same thing, which is not solutional to our problem at all. The anthropologist also points out uh, that the greatest drive in the world is the culture drive. And that when anything happens to the culture drive, uh, the forward motion of everything begins to lag. The individual is always moved by overtones. He is moved by dreams, by hopes, by aspirations, uh, by the desire of fulfilling some internal power pressure within his own consciousness. Where this is removed as an incentive and the individual feels himself frustrated in the search for self-expression or the expression of culture through himself, he gradually lags on every other level of life. It is like the person whose psychology is confused and in a short time this confusion causes him to be inefficient as a businessman, causes him to be inefficient as a family person, and causes him gradually to lose even the desire to live. The loss of the desire to live is very often associated with the loss of cultural drive, the loss of the drive to make the world better and more beautiful rather than merely bigger and stronger. This means uh, that to anthropology, the future of the world must depend upon its cultural leadership. And it points out that this has always been the case, that uh, the truly honored names, the great people who are remembered, are for the most part powerful culture units. We admire the individuals who have left us beauty more than we admire those who have left us strength. Uh, we may write some histories about Napoleon and people of that nature, but in our simple daily living, we are much closer to our poets, to our mystics, to our scholars, to our artists. Uh, we, we feel a kinship with that which is lovable and is essentially beautiful and good. And we bestow gradually, and perhaps very tardily, our applause upon those who have made such contributions. Thus instinctively we seek culture, and we seek cultural outlet, but we do not know exactly how to make it fit into the present program of things. Anthropology, like all other branches of learning, appeals to both individuals and to groups. As an individual, the attainment of culture is perhaps easier than it is on a collective level. At the same time, however, uh, collective momentums, once they can be created, once they can be caused to move, uh, very often carry whole groups of persons with them along the road to some powerful cultural achievement. So anthropology says that tomorrow, the future of the world in which we live, is a future very skillfully and wonderfully uh, compounded out of the beauty, out of the truth, out of the nobility that has preceded us, plus the vision which we ourselves can bestow, and the coordination which the contemporary must always impose upon the fragments of non-contemporary ideas. Thus we gather, we bring together that which has previously been given and use it as an immediate instrument of insight and interpret it, uh, rearrange it, and cause it to fit into the pressing need of beauty or of truth or of wisdom or of love within our own existence and our own personal culture problem. So the uh, anthropologist takes it for granted 
that if the world a hundred years from now is merely a further exaggeration of the present world, that the future is merely the present pushed into the next century, that we are going to be in a very bad way, and that in all probabilities if we push the now far enough, we will simply exterminate ourselves. Uh, this point is uh, defensible on grounds of examining other peoples who got into ruts by which they were unable to keep the cultural sky clear above them. They lost the power to be free to become better and in so doing they signed their own death warrants. Actually, however, nature is such that it is very difficult to lock man totally within a mechanistic pattern. He rebels of himself. The pattern becomes too heavy for him. He finds himself sicker and sicker under it until on one level or another he rebels. Therefore man by instinct is a breaker of patterns. He is a constant rebel against the authorities which lock him. And for this reason alone despotism can seldom permanently achieve its ends. These ends create so much reaction that the despotism itself is ultimately overthrown. However, with the present type of mind, anthropology points out the danger of the contamination of imagination <coughs> by our present way of life. Actually, our imagination or the inner life of the creativity of the person, if this becomes infected to the degree that he cannot find anything more beautiful than what he is doing, or that what he is doing satisfies him so completely that he is not culturally hungry, this is bad, this is dangerous. And that is the reason why it is an unfortunate that science, religion, literature, art, music, and all of these diversified elements which should make up culture all become locked in one pattern. If this is so, then there is no open ground for rebellion. There is no obvious need for things to be different. And the individual escaping from one pattern falls into only another bracket of the same pattern. And in this way, gains no true relief or release from pattern. Culture is always associated with a kind of archetype. Every people has had its dream. It has had some deeply submerged purpose which drives it, which has prevented it from extinction, which has caused it to defend its institutions uh, to the bitter end. This drive has always in it some utopian clause or phase. It is always in some way the belief that we all live by that tomorrow is going to be a little better. This the problem of tomorrow being better, of course, runs against philosophy, for tomorrow can only be better if we make it better. And the problem of hope without work also offers no tangible solution. But it is dangerous to us as individuals and as groups to think of better, this better tomorrow, without seeing or feeling in it any release or expression for the instinctive desire of our own for happiness, peace, security, friendliness, kindliness, cooperation, and understanding. When we cannot look forward to these as having some advancement, then we are locked within the very selfish and dubious pattern of some way transferring or attempting to find consolation merely in toys which in themselves solve nothing. And the idea of the rocket reaching the moon is a kind of a toy which we use 
uh, and which becomes important to us very largely to the degree that we are a frustrated neurotic people. Not that this will actually bring us any happiness, but we will become wildly excited the day it happens. Uh, we will all shake hands with everybody, feel that we have made a monumental step in the conquest of existence, and then go right on with exactly the same personal problems we have always had. And if uh, it should happen that somewhere along the line we happen to find a warlike planet that looks like it might want to invade us or something of that nature, the discovery will bring us not peace but further fears, doubts, and misgivings. So actually, we have no reason to assume uh, that any type of activity which has failed to produce happiness in the past is likely to produce it in the future. And what we term happiness is becoming more and more a sort of resigning to inevitables. It's a very static thing. The individual doing the best he can, which is very poor, and uh, hoping for the best without very much ground for hope in that direction. If, on the other hand, culture is allowed to have its own way, the anthropologist can see a great many things that desperately need the doing. And he bases his concepts now upon his own scientific estimation of what has been done. He examines the great motion of culture itself. Not the motion that we have imposed upon it, but the grand motion, which can be estimated perhaps only in terms of 10, 20, 50, or 100,000 years. He perceives dimly that there is a grand strategy in this moral, ethical, cultural motion within and around man. He perceives that where man does not know where he is going, that there is a motion that will carry him there if he will let it carry him there. And that this motion is not mysterious or inexplicable in itself that it is a reasonable motion. And out of certain experiences that he has observed and studied, and which he approaches almost psychologically in recognizing the results of various errors in culture upon the groups where these errors arose, the anthropologist sees himself moving along towards something that could be very much better than it is today, and which he feels uh, has importance. He thinks of science as making certain definite contributions to this, not because science primarily uh, may have intention of contributing to culture, although many scientists undoubtedly do feel the importance of their cultural contribution. There are certain things, however, which science makes possible. And these things are essentially, perhaps, under two headings, communication and transportation. These two are perhaps among the most important scientific contributions to culture. Communication while it begins with a problem that is unsolved, still offers a suggestion for solution. It is interesting that scientifically we should have invented means of carrying the human voice around the world long before we invented any means by which the people listening could come to understand each other's words. It is interesting that we have world communication on a mechanical level, on an electrical level, and we still have language barriers by means of which this marvelous invention is prevented from reaching three quarters of its potential audience. This is an example of where science, ignoring culture, is now faced with a debit. 
The Voice of America, trying to work, for instance, in uh, the Iron Curtain countries, has quite an elaborate procedure on its hands. It must bring in individuals of many languages and have these programs carefully translated for the benefit of people who do not speak each other's languages, but we hope sometime will work together in economically, politically, or culturally. So we have solved the great problem of communication, but not the basic one. Namely, that communication is a problem of individuals having a spoken word in common. Thus, anthropology points out the tremendous importance of the development and final recognition of an international language. This is both uh, anthropologically and politically indicated. And uh, we've had experiments, but most of them have been half-hearted. Perhaps the outstanding experiment up to the present time has been Esperanto. But we still are faced with the problem that science now makes it possible for men to communicate with each other. And through various devices such as television, motion pictures, things of that nature, it is possible for us to share very largely in the cultural lives of other people. But in our motion pictures, most cases, these sharings are destroyed by the falsification of the documentation. No effort is made for authenticity. And for that reason, we think we are sharing and we become more befuddled than before. And one of our school teacher not long ago told me that it's very difficult to teach children history when they are exposed to motion pictures in which history is distorted out of all shape and form in the effort to preserve or to create uh, some falsified romantic situation. A next problem that we do have that can be anthropologically significant is transportation. Here we have the possibility of the individual moving quickly into other culture groups and also moving toward the experience of world contact with culture. Areas totally isolated 50 years ago are now accessible in terms of ours. It is perfectly possible for the individual to have first-hand contact with his world. Transportation also breaks down the immediate isolation of purely local cultural patterns. A hundred years ago, only one person in ten left an area of a hundred miles of his birthplace during his lifetime. Today, nearly everyone has the opportunity of looking over the fence into somebody else's yard and see what is going on there. This is culturally significant, but loses most of its value unless these elements are emphasized, pointed out, and given an opportunity to bear their proper fruit. Of course, world trade also has an effect on culture, for culture has always, almost automatically, followed the trade routes. And where we enter a country, perhaps largely to buy its goods, we may ultimately share its culture. This was, has been a common experience for the last 10,000 years. Anthropology then points out the importance at this particular phase of coming into a rational communion with world culture. And very definitely points out that cultures do not overlap nearly as much as we think they do. It is still possible to distinguish practically all cultural patterns, even if you mix them up. You can rediscover the separate threads and put them together again. Cultures are highly complementary. Against the complementary relation of culture is your highly competitive attitude of so-called superior peoples. Anthropology says that one thing we've got to get out of our system forever is the concept of superior people. That we must have the concept of essentially different people, each one to be measured by its own yardstick and recognized for its potential contributions to a total culture as yet incomplete. <laughs>
if any race or nation or culture group had performed the miracle of producing a perfect culture, then we might say that others are not necessary. But we stand as we have always stood, in the immediate need of additional complementary culture.